Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the daily chart of silver from netdania.com. And I've drawn a couple of trend lines in here. The primary trend line, of course, is going to be this downtrend line. There are many ways you can draw it, but you can see that there are a lot of touch points. You can also go up and draw it from like the top of this line and it catches a few more. But either way you draw it, you can see that it's a uh, still in an uptrend clearly marked out by this trend line here we're gonna to have to have a test really of sixteen dollars to um, penetrate that uptrend and that could happen it looks like we're rolling over you can see that this top here is actually lower than this other top so we may be looking at a buying opportunity I'm going to cover um, some potential buys although you'll see here when I cover the sites that I watch the most that the amount of coins available especially with the lunar series that's the one I watch uh, is is very very thin so let's get over to the Bitcoin chart here it, it is in the midst of a correction right now it, it, it had a tremendous run up uh, nearly eight hundred dollars and you can see we're back to roughly I think the Huobi price is 670 and we're going to talk a little bit about China. That's going to be one of the keys to um, this story. But um, obviously, we can see it's still driven from China at 668 on Huobi. is a little bit higher than 665 on Bitfinex and the Russian exchange, 645, 660 on Bitstamp. So they've definitely tightened up. The arbitrage is working, and that's very fascinating to me how arbitrage works in cryptocurrencies there's a lot of um, different transactions required to make the arbitrage work but we know that in free markets if there's an incentive to make a profit then someone's going to fill that uh, hole and uh, if they can make money doing it they're going to and what that does is in markets it tightens up the the spread. It tightens up the bid ask spread. It also tightens up the ARB spread, which is the difference between these markets. So they're actually really, really tight, with the highest being about 670 and the lowest being about 645. That's probably the tightest we've seen it. But it is uh, in a correction phase. And you can see that it's in a correction from a very massive pennant breakout. So a bullish reaction would be one where it bounced off this um, let's pull back a little bit here so if we bounce off this pennant which is very very clear on the chart uh, this pennant here oh, it's not drawing but if we bounce back to that area and then Let's go back to the six hour here. Uh, back here in this area, if we bounce back to this and then go higher, uh, that's a typical normal correction. But if we penetrate this area down here around, well, it's 4,000, let's go to bit stamp. If we penetrate this area down around 586, 600, and keep going, then obviously we've got a serious uh, short term bear market. I do not expect that this massive, massive pennant area will fail uh, at 450. I think that we will, uh, if we do reach it, which I don't think we will, but if we do reach it, uh, we're going to bounce off it and go much, much higher. So I wanted to talk about the concept of encryption and cryptography and what's behind Bitcoin, although it's a little bit different than where I'm going with this because with Bitcoin, you're actually talking about a math problem that uh, is solvable. And that's how the blockchain works. Uh, you have various miners trying to uh, solve the next problem. And the one who finds the correct answer to the cryptographic problem is the one that wins the prize and they get the certain set amount of bitcoins which changes over time as it becomes more difficult as the difficulty increases 
So that's how Bitcoin is designed. It's designed to have computers working uh, very, very hard to try to solve a cryptographic problem. Now, but what I want to talk about is the concept of cryptography and what it allows for in the modern world. So most of you who work in the corporate world are familiar with VPNs. I deal with them on a daily basis as a network engineer. We get calls from people all the time who are having problem connecting to their corporate VPN or are saying that they are, they're having packet loss across the VPN or the tunnel is dropping, etc. And I wanted to just explain to you conceptually how we look at these things to understand them from a technical perspective and troubleshoot them. So when you're troubleshooting a VPN, which is essentially encryption and cryptography, you're troubleshooting what we use, the term we use to describe a VPN is a tunnel. So if you want to think about that and understand how that works, uh, you just need to understand that anytime you're talking about a transaction on the web, let's say, a, uh, an instance where you visit a site or you do anything on the internet, you're talking about a communication between two computers. And that's what we, we in network engineering, it's, the, it's called the OSI stack or the, um, the, the military model. And what that means is that uh, you have two computers communicating over a wire and ultimately they're connected between a wire. You can actually track that wire from any computer in the world to any other computer in the world. If they're communicating, there actually is a physical link, although there could be a wireless link, but for the most part, it's a physical link between those two devices. Now, if those two devices are running a form of encryption, if they're running a VPN, something like that, then what they do is they set a password on each end and then they scramble the data based upon the uh, password that they have set on each end. So what that does is the conceptual model we use to troubleshoot this type of thing is a tunnel. So you can imagine if you had a computer in your room, I have a computer in my room, and we want to communicate across uh, a VPN, we want to have secure communications, then what that means is that I open up my end of the tunnel, you open up your end of the tunnel, and whatever I shove into my end of the tunnel goes across the internet through that tunnel and comes out the other end. Now, for all intents and purposes, that tunnel is unbreakable. It's just based upon math. Uh, I've explained before how all you have to do is think about the number of letters in the alphabet with capitals. You're talking about 52 characters. You add on uh, 10 numbers and, and then maybe a symbol or two and you, you've got 64. You've got uh, encryption with 64 characters. Now, if you extend out that address, uh, something like a YouTube address like yeah, lowercase a dash one six uppercase p um, you're multiplying by 64 each time you you step out on that chain and you can see how that would reach a level of impenetrable um, uh, comp complexity that could not be broken even by the greatest supercomputer so that's what we're talking about is that encryption has allowed for two-way communications over the internet that are unbreakable. In other words, it's a tunnel and no one can get in it. No one can find out what is happening in that tunnel except for the people who are on either end, the A end or the Z end of that tunnel. Now, that's why we see these attempts by governments to uh, break into the tunnel. Now, we know that the, that the laws about them being able to tap the wire and things like that those are phony laws because they can't. They, they're the ones who created encryption and they know they can't break it. So uh, they create a lot of fake stories. But the reality is that for them to break into your communication, what they need to do is either A, control the software that's on the computers that are communicating, either the 
A or Z end computers. Uh, they have to control that software, the operating system, or they have to control the hardware. So this article is about Windows 10 and their attempt to control the software. Uh, I'll read a little bit here. Windows 10 is amazing. Windows 10 is fantastic. Windows 10 is glorious. Windows 10 is faster, smoother, more user-friendly than any Windows operating system that has come before it. Windows 10 is everything Windows 8 should have been, addressing nearly every major problem the users had with Microsoft's previous generation platform in one fell swoop. But there's something you should know. As you read this article, your newly upgraded PC Windows 10 is also spying on nearly everything you do. Now, let's just read the excerpt here. This is an ex excerpt from Microsoft's privacy statement. And this privacy statement is a 12,000 word service agreement. But here's the key here. This is what Microsoft makes you agree to, to use their operating system, Windows 10. Finally, we will access, disclose, and preserve personal data, including your content, such as the content of your emails, other private communications or files in private folders, when we have a good faith belief that doing so is necessary to one, comply with ap applicable law or respond to valid legal process, including from law enforcement or other government agencies, two, to protect our customers, for example, to prevent spam or attempts to defraud users of services or help prevent the loss of life or serious injury of anyone. Three, operate and maintain the security of our services, including to prevent or stop an attack on our computer systems or networks. Or four, protect the rights or property of Microsoft, including enforcing the terms governing the use of services, etc. So you can see that this basically is a <laughs> this is kind of a, a, an exception you can drive a truck through. This uh, basically they can do anything they want. So they're telling you openly that they have access to your data. If you're going to run this operating system, then any pictures, any files, any communications, anything you have on your computer is able to be uploaded to Microsoft or documented by Microsoft and then turned over to the authorities. So that is their method of attack, of not being able to defeat the encrypted tunnel. They go to the end device that creates the tunnel and create a back door into the device. Now, the other method that you have was something that we saw when they introduced the clipper chip. The clipper chip is the ability for them to break in through your hardware. It's a back door through hardware. And I'll read a little bit of this. The Clipper chip was a chipset that was developed and promoted by the United States National Security Agency, the NSA, as an encryption device with a built-in back door intended to be adopted by telecommunications companies for voice transmission. It was announced in 1993 and 1996 was entirely defunct. Uh, let's read the backlash. Organizations such as the Electronic Privacy Information Center and Electronic Free Frontier Foundation challenged the Clipper chip proposal saying it would have the effect not only of subjecting citizens to increased and possibly illegal government surveillance, but that the strength of the Clipper chip's encryption could not be evaluated by public as, as design was classified secret and that therefore individuals and businesses might be hobbled with an insecure communication system. So this is the second method that they have to break into the encrypted tunnel that you can create. So just to rehash this so you understand, because a lot of times I'm not clear. Encryption allows for you to create a tunnel between your computer and another computer anywhere in the world. Just as Bitcoin allows you to send money between your computer and any computer anywhere in the world. And that encrypted tunnel that passes over the internet is an unbreakable tunnel. It is a method of communication where only the endpoints can uh, determine what is being said. If the, if the message is intercepted, so if a mirror is created anywhere along the line, and that can obviously be done, if someone mirrors any port on any device where this is passing, and if you are in the business I'm in, you understand that uh, fiber optic switching 
is based on the distance of uh, how far you can go before retransmission based on the speed of light. And you can really only go 84K with most optics. Uh, so uh, if you're talking about going through uh, or across the United States, for example, with 3,000 miles, um, you're talking about a series of maybe 30 to 50 to 60 uh, we'll say 50 to 60 switches or routers that you're passing through to communicate from New York to California. Every one of those devices in between can mirror a port and copy the communications that you're sending. But when it's an encrypted tunnel that's passing from one end to the other, what they're going to get is garbage because they don't have the key. They don't have the encrypted key. So without the key to decipher the message that's being sent, it is just a bunch of garbage. Uh, so they must focus on the endpoint, and that is the software. Now the next point is going to be the hardware, and, and that's the clipper chip. Now the story I want to show you is this, this story about China creating the world's fastest computer without relying on US hardware for the first time. So. A long time ago, China abandoned Microsoft and Apple and all of the uh, Western uh, operating systems because they knew backdoors were being created into them. And if you are a ruler of a foreign country and you're getting your uh, software from your enemy, then obviously they're going to be able to create backdoors into the software, break in and see exactly what you're doing. So China closed that door a long time ago, but now China is actually closing the hardware door. And you can see here, I'll read a little bit of this. China creates the world's fastest computer without relying on US hardware for the first time. A Chinese supercomputer has been named the world's fastest computer for the seventh year in a row, but unlike previous winners, this year's champion uses only Chinese de designed processors representing a decline of U.S. dominance in the field. The new title holder, the Sunway Telluite at the National Supercomputing Center in Wuxi, was developed by China National Research Center of Parallel Computing, Engineering, and Technology. The supercomputer uses a Chinese-developed Shenwei processor, ending any remaining speculation that China would have to rely on Western technology to compete effectively in the upper echelons of supercomputing said a statement by the top 500 project ranking the world's fastest supercomputers. So China knows what's going on. China understands that there is encryption. China understands that there are backdoors into the operating systems, the software. China understands that there are backdoors into the hardware that runs everything. And they've already endgamed this. They've gone around it. So now that we have encrypted tunnels that can cross the internet and now that we have another country creating their own hardware and their own software uh, the people at the NSA are defeated they cannot spy on China using this technology and I would venture to guess that this technology probably will rapidly expand and uh, it will be the case that every sovereign country will be able to protect their data communications uh, with either their own hardware and software or using an existing platform. Now, I would guess that if they're going to rely on China's, I would bet that the Chinese government has probably built backdoors into uh, the Chinese operating system and the Chinese chipset, just like the United States has built backdoors into the Windows operating system and uh, the Intel chipsets, the Clipper chip type chipsets. So this is more confirmation for me that uh, the balance of power in the world is, as the Bible set, as the Bible predicts, in my opinion, in Daniel seven, between the major powers, which is Great Britain, America, China, uh, Russia and a revived Roman Empire, which may or may not be the EU. So let's jump over to the silver picks here. Now, we'll start off with Atmex and the 
amount that's available is very, very small and it's, it's very, very thin. So you can see I've sorted these from just silver and from price low to high and you can see the Lunar Monkey is there at $14. Now you can get it cheaper elsewhere. I think you can still get it for $12. I might have this, uh, it might have been uh, JM Bullion. But we immediately jump to the half ounce colorized monkey, uh, the colorized half ounce horse at $21, and uh, the colorized uh, lunar monkey king, and then we get the half ounce lunar goat all the way up at $26. Uh, the uh, one ounce lunar monkey is $30, and then we've got the half ounce snake at $33. The half ounce dragon is out of stock, um, and the half ounce horse is all the way up at thirty five bucks. So it definitely confirms that these, if, if obviously it's uh, based on the idea that Atmex prices are accurate, but if Atmex prices are accurate, then uh, the Lunar Series strategy has paid off. So there's really not a lot available. We want to watch the half ounce lunar monkey. If we do get a price drop, that's going to be the go-to coin. Now on Gainesville coins, things are even more bleak. You can see the cheapest coin there is the half ounce colorized monkey at 16 bucks. That's $32 an ounce. That's way too much. Uh, next one is the monkey with lion privy. Again, about 30 bucks. And then it just go it gets worse from there. So not a lot available there. Now on Provident, you can see it's really bad as well. They don't have any half ounce monkeys. The next one they have is the half ounce horse. Now, if you're a gambler, uh, I think there's better things to buy, but I think that's probably underpriced by maybe five to 10 bucks at 18 bucks for the half ounce horse. Um, you can see then there's the half ounce goat, the half ounce dragon, and uh, so there's really, again, not a lot available. Um, so that's really a good thing if you think about it, because uh, what that means, we've seen this for quite a while this year, just not a lot of coins available for the new releases. And what that means is that, uh, in my opinion, there's just not a lot of demand, uh, and not a lot being ordered and that's probably going to be bullish because uh, the Perth Mint tends to mint based on demand. They don't mint based on end user demand except indirectly. So the people who sell to the end user, when they run out, they'll order a new batch. And for whatever reason there is that these are sold out or the batches aren't there or they're thin, this has probably been the worst year I've seen for availability of these Perth coins. Now, moving forward, that's going to be very, very bullish because we're probably going to see uh, a very low mintage. So that could be good. Keep an eye on the half ounce monkey. That's going to be my pick moving forward. So back to the Bitcoin chart. Um, Bitcoin takes advantage of cryptography. Uh, Bitcoin is actually based on a solvable math problem, whereas uh, cryptographic uh, VPN tunnels and uh, communicating anonymously over the internet, over uh, VPNs and other uh, cryptographic uh, technologies, uh, those can't be broken. So we know that governments are going to try to find back doors into the end user software or end user hardware. We've seen now that China has made a full end run around this and China is not going to comply with Western spying. Uh, that's going to confirm that uh, China is on the rise. Again, the West is on the decline. This pattern is going to continue for many, many years going forward, probably beyond our lifetime. So I would say prepare accordingly. And we'll talk to you next time.